Hey there guys, this video will basically cover all the details about every single gladiator and it basically also shows what role they play in a gladiator team. Hope you enjoy. Alright, before we begin talking about the specific gladiators and what they do, let's first talk about stats. So on the left hand side, you can see strength, agility, and intelligence. These three stats will basically determine the number shown here. It's basically how effective your spell is. And this number will increase as you increase your strength, agility, or intelligence. It also will affect the execution time and the cooldown. On the right hand side is basically the status of your gladiator during your fights. Health is basically the amount of damage your gladiator can take before they die. And stamina is basically the amount of spells or abilities that your gladiators can use before they run out and be a Sydney duck. For example, this ability will cost 70 stamina. So after he attacks seven times, he'll run out of stamina and he'll just be a sitting duck. Lastly, for movement, is basically how fast your gladiator moves. Pretty self-explanatory. Let's first go in depth into all the frontliners of the game. The frontliners are also known as a tank because of their ability to block or taking as much damage without actually losing health. Block is really fundamental for a frontliner because they can stall and they have the ability to enable their carries to, you know, fight longer and not die because they're going to be taking most of the damage. These guys are basically the fundamental for every single comp or group of gladiators because they're there to take damage and survive as long as possible. Without them, the carries in the back line who have who are basically the last cannons or basically damage dealers that have a lot of damage but very little health will basically struggle to keep up. First off, let's start with the knight, which is basically the beginner, basically early game tank unit of the team. A lot of things I've mistakes I've seen from people is that they build agility because this melee attack scales with seven agility and two strength, right? And you usually don't want to build Knight as your main damage. You actually want to build him for his shield block. So his shield block scales with 7 intelligence and 1.5 agility. Which is pretty strong if you ask me. Like basically if you upgrade this guy to like you know 50 strength. He can block basically 350 damage. Which is like a lot of damage for just a block. This one has a cooldown however. But this cooldown scales really well with intelligence. It scales with 0 0.071, which is really high. So if you think about it, every single two points you put on this intelligence, his cooldown will be reduced by 1, 0.14, which is pretty a lot. Like it's not like a, it's like a linear thing, you know. And his minimum is 0.15. Wanna you want to get down to 0.3, so you can block continuously. Lastly, I want to talk about the health and stamina. This is the thing where you usually want to prioritize most for tanks in general. You don't want to prioritize these stats. These stats are secondary. These stats are primary for sure. You don't want to upgrade movement, of course. But health and stamina is important. And to determine whether or not you need more health or stamina, you look at the gladiator fights and you check to see if they're running out of stamina or health. Alright, let's move on to... The melee attack. Here's a demonstration of how intelligence affects the cooldown of the shooting. Every two intelligence points reduce it by 0.15 and look at the cooldown difference. The guard. Very similar to the knight, it's in order to obtain this character you have to be in alliance with the baroness. And he has two of the same abilities as a knight. He has a melee attack and he also has a block. This block is almost the exact same except that his cooldown scales with agility. So just keep that in mind. He also has this thing, this trait called power in numbers, which means that the more units there are on your team, the more stats he get up to 70%. So you want to use him for a late game. He's like basically a replacement for the knight. All right. The Marauder. This is basically a bandit version of a knight. He has three abilities instead of two. So his first ability is a melee attack. 
this is basically a more of a damage carry version of a knight because his strength and agility scales pretty well and here's the stats for execution time it's always agility usually for a melee cam character and intelligence for a melee character also his block is a little bit weaker than the knights it's six instead of seven which is a little bit weaker but you compensate it with the damage and also a shield bash the shield bash is basically just a stun basically so it's the damage scales with more with agility and the duration scales with agility the execution time is here and the cooldown always scales with intelligence all right moving on towards the fence wielder this is basically a people alliance version of a knight so he has two main abilities the punch and the wooden fence block what the punch basically does is basically the damage it scales with five agility the execution time scales with agility and the cooldown scales with intelligence all right moving on towards the actual ability that matters more is his wooden fence block basically this block is a little bit different from the knight it has way more scaling however it has a negative side effect after taking that amount of damage the shield is gonna break so you want to only use this character if you're confident in your team that you're gonna destroy the enemy team before the shield breaks he's, he's a really good solo tank honestly blocking that much amount of damage is decent in the mid game early to mid game but later on it might be a problem his cooldown is way weaker than the knights but still decent because you have this as your block all right moving on towards the cleric you usually get this unit usually in the late game when you you uh, unlock like the seventh or eighth arena where you it's like in the mountains or something and he has three main abilities the melee attack the divine hero circle and another shield block so his melee attack is pretty self-explanatory one strength for agility here are stats if you want to see them and his special ability is a uh, divine hero circle this thing i find it not really that useful honestly because you're gonna have a healer anyways but just if you want to just have fun here's scaling on the area usually area effect abilities have a radius that scales with strength and then the healing scales with intelligence here's also the execution time for mages usually agility is how they get execution time and cooldown lastly shield block it's a little bit weaker than the knights it scales with strength and agility and yeah he's basically a healer knight version which is if you want to experiment with random comps i have i haven't experienced much with this guy but it's very interesting to like have like a frontline heavy comp with this guy because he, he can heal multiple targets around his radius which is really good for uh melee focus comp last but not least we have the executioner this guy is the least resembling of a tank because he does not have a shield the only reason why i put him in here was because of the what's his name high necromancer yeah the high necromancer has units and this guy's the only guy that resembles a tank or a frontliner so his abilities are pretty self-explanatory the melee attack here's the scaling if you want to see it it's pretty pretty normal and he has some special abilities that do more damage towards cursed enemies so you usually want to pair this guy up with other uh a lot like units from the the higher necromancer alliance because he, they apply a curse one of the characters apply a, cur a curse and this guy does more damage based on that curse he has a weapon block most of the characters without a shield will have a weapon block and it basically scale it's basically a block version but it scales more with agility and it's less impactful and yeah that's pretty much it and his shadow burst is his special ability that basically hits the ground around him in a area effect that scales with intelligence i mean agility and his damage goes to intelligence usually we just want to build agility and health on this guy if you want to build him tank and that's pretty much it for all the frontliners moving on towards the melee carries the reason why i call them melee carries is because they have lethal which is basically the ability to do a bunch of damage to a target maybe even killing them with one hit because of their scaling on strength and agility most of you guys have 10 or more strength and agility scaling which means that for every point you put in strength or agility you get 10 points of 
damage, which is very high for a character, way more than the frontliners that was shown before. And these guys can basically carry you fights because they just eliminate targets really quick. First up is a character that we all know and love, the Berserker. The reason why this character is so loved is because at the beginning of the game, there's three units that are provided as default, and it's the Knights, the Berserker, and the Archer. And this guy is basically the strongest early game unit of the team when it comes to 1v1s because of his damage to just do a bunch, his ability to just do a bunch of damage. And a lot of people compare this guy to a knight, which is wrong because they are different units. This guy is meant to do damage and the knight is meant to block. If you compare the tankiness of this guy compared to the knight, it's a whole different level because the knight can block archers, which is really important because berserkers get knocked back by ranged units really hard. And that's how you beat berserkers. You just put ranged units and you slowly kite them away and do too much damage for him. All right, let's move on towards his abilities. A long, long axe attack. I emphasize on the long. So it basically does a bunch of damage. Scales with 13 strength and 4.5 agility. However, this is a negative side effect that a lot of people don't know. So this, this ability cannot be used once the enemy gets in Berserker's minimum range. That means you don't want him to, you don't want to put him close. You want to put him behind a knight or behind another frontliner. So he's able to maximize his damage. Because if you compare this to his punch, which is his normal ability, it's way less. It scales more with agility. So if you actually want to play him for his agility, then you actually play for punch rather than his long range attack. His long range attack scales more with strength and his punch scales more with agility. And here are the scaling on the cooldowns and ex execution time if you guys want to know. Here's for the punch. And then his core ability that a lot of people value way more than the knight is his kick, which is basically a stun for melee units. It's actually really strong. And a lot of people say that this guy is 10 times better because of the amount of abilities that he can use versus the knights. Lastly, he has a weapon block, which is very typical for a, a melee w character without a shield. And yeah, it's basically just a weaker version of a block. That scales with agility. Next up is the Mace Wielder. To obtain this character, you have to beat up, beat the first tournament or the second tournament. I'm not really sure, but it's basically a strength version of the Berserker because he basically does the same thing except that he has the longer range, and he basically has only two attacks, which is his Mace attack, which scales with strength, and the stun also. However, he he has the same thing as the Berserker where he can't be close to use it. He's actually really good because he prioritizes uh, He's like a kiter. He's like a protector actually the way he, if you see him in an actual fight he actually Blocks for the ranged units. So if there's an assassin coming towards him He actually pushes them away, which is really good for kiting and he has a melee attack if you're too close and It's basically a weaker version of the mace attack and here's the scaling on the execution time and the cooldown. All right, moving on to Wargs. Wargs are basically like the early game assassin. He prioritizes the backline and he has two main abilities. One is Bite, which basically does a bunch of damage, scales with strength. And yeah, it just does a bunch of damage. It's really good for just attacking the backline and just one shotting or one hitting them. And then his second ability is Dodge. So it basically. If there's an arrow coming this way, he can actually just dodge it and not get hit. And also scales with the cooldown scales with intelligence. While we're in the topic of units that can access the backline, let's talk about the mana assassin. The mana assassin is only accessible for later stages in the game where you can beat probably beat the fourth or fifth tournament. And the reason why he's a little bit better than the work is because his ability to stealth himself before the battle. So he basically Nobody can detect him until he starts attacking them first. And his first attack will be Shadow Strike. Shadow Strike is basically this ability where he can just one-shot his opponent. And it's actually so very surprising that it scales with intelligence rather than agility. And it's basically the same, very similar to Worked, except that more damage, of course. 
and it also applies to bleed. Just if you want to see, after his after his stealth, he he goes on to his normal attack, which is his his melee attack, which is not as strong as other characters. It doesn't have that much scaling. What you're getting this character for is just one shot in the back line. And then after that, you're just causing disruption. And here are the, you know, stats if you want to see the cooldowns. His second ability is a weapon block, pretty self-explanatory. And then his uh, third ability is dodge, very similar to the works. And he's basically just the one-shot version of the work, and he can't be seen until he strikes a target first. Moving on to the Pitchforkman, which is basically the People Alliance of the Spearmen. And you can see the common theme. Most of these carries do a lot of damage because they are not in their minimum range. You always want to play them around their maximum range because they have extreme scaling on their abilities. His first ability is Pitchfork Attack, which is basically a strength version of basically, you know, a damage, a strength damage version of doing a bunch of damage. Here's the scaling on execution time and the cooldown. And he has also has a block, pretty self explanatory. And he also has a punch if the unit gets too close. You usually want to build him around strength and not agility. Usually, how it works is that once he gets uh, in his maximum range, it scales with the strength or agility. And then if, if he gets too close, it'll be the opposite. And here are the stats for cooldown and execution time. Last but not least of the damage carries is the Spearman. I think they forgot to add the minimum thing, but it, it still applies. So he's basically the agility version of the Pitchforkman, which we just saw before. It's basically the same thing, except that he can push them away with it, which is pretty cool. And same thing, the weapon block as his second ability. And then the dagger attack, which is the opposite of the main ability, which is spear attack. And it scales with strength instead. And last but not least, the power in numbers, which is shown earlier. Moving on towards the range damage carries, these guys can basically throw projectiles that do a bunch of damage. And they have an accuracy also. You have to keep that in mind. And these guys, you can build a comp around them. And having one or two of these guys, they can basically just carry the game. First up is the archer. So her, her main ability is shooting an arrow. It actually scales more with strength and agility. But trust me, you just want to build agility. That's because the accuracy is really important. Once you get the accuracy to 95%, then you might want to switch to strength. But I would highly advise you to do so because you want to get the execution down time to the same as cooldown. And her melee attack is rarely used unless your team is losing really hard. It's basically just if the units get too close to her, she, do, she just hits them. And it's really weak compared to the actual era. And her last ability is a dodge, very similar to Assassin's. She can dodge projectiles with a certain amount of damage. So you want to... This is a, another reason why you should upgrade agility. Because you just want to maximize the amount of damage that she can dodge. So if, if it's 100 damage and she's not able to dodge it, that's just unlucky. Next up is the Hunter. You can actually get him pretty early on if you have enough wood to buy a building for him. Very similar to Archer. He has a lot of damage and it scales mainly on agility. Instead of building this guy mainly on agility, you actually might want to consider him with strength. That's because his other abilities scale with strength. For example, his burst shot, which is basically a shotgun, scales insanely well with strength. And the accuracy doesn't really matter as much because it's a shotgun. You can't really miss a shotgun shot. Very similar to the archer, if somebody gets too close, he'll do a melee attack. And he has a dodge ability in case somebody tries to shoot him from far away and just dodges it. Or somebody hits him. He also can place a trap, which is very unique because if you know that you're fighting against a melee assassin or any other characters that like can access the backline, you can place a trap and you can basically just keep distance. Always keep distance. And that's what makes him different with the archer. Moving on towards the brigand, you can actually find him by finding a bandit shop after you like do a single quest, some some quests, and Slen will 
provide you like options for bandit units and he's a little bit different from the archer because he has the ability to pierce which basically if it kills an enemy it will continue flying so you want to place this character to line up with you know multiple enemies if you do a lot of damage mainly you want to do strength as the main damage but you want to increase the accuracy a little bit more you usually want to 85 to 90 percent before you upgrading you before you start upgrading strength here's the execution time and the cooldown and very similar to the archer he has melee attack if they get too close and his special ability is to throw a net it's basically very similar to a trap but it's a projectile version and it's very accurate and it basically stuns the enemy for pretty long which is really good all right let's move on towards the uh, granny she might look old but you know she packs a punch like she's actually really strong when you're like having a really weak team that can't block her damage so her main ability is her kitchen knife which is one of the scariest projectiles out there that's because if you can't block it you're gonna be knocked down and yeah it's actually insanely insanely strong if you don't have immune to knockdowns or you don't have enough block to block that damage and here's the stats and you just want to build her with half strength and half agility that's usually the case because you want to build enough strength so they can't block it and you want to build agility so she can't miss and they can be knocked down and here's the melee it's basically the opposite of what her main stat is which is agility and usually you don't want to use that anyways the crossbowman in order to obtain this character you have to be in alliance with the baroness and he's basically you know the royal royal guard of you know the archer he has a punch which scales with strength his main ability is a crossbow shot shot which is really scales really well with the agility and another thing that you might consider is that the fact that it has 100 percent accuracy so he's really good if you you know just want to do agility and just one shot people he also has power and numbers last but not least is a storm dwarf the reason why i didn't put him as a melee carry is because he has a range ability also and you know if he's a mixed character then might as well put him in this one all right first off is his melee attack it's actually pretty strong and most of his abilities scale with basically what's the weather currently and if he has heavy wind he's actually it's actually better for him to melee attack than shoot and here's the scaling on the execution time and the cooldown and then his shoot ability which is basically his core ability i would say it actually scales with intelligence rather than agility and in the crits and miss it actually buffs him up so this guy really relies on the weather so you if you want to play this guy he's actually pretty goofy and you know you have to look at for the weather to play him so you can actually maximize his basically his traits and heavy wind he actually has this electric attack that basically does a bunch of damage not really that much but like it it just burns them and then it just knocks them down and then his last ability is his weapon block pretty self-explanatory and that's that's the storm drift. you can access him later in the game moving on towards the mages most of these characters have high enough scaling and intelligence that they can basically do a bunch of damage and can even carry fights most of these guys apply statuses which is basically negative effects that basically makes the enemy weaker in some way and they're very unique in their abilities first up is the pyromancer she can be accessed pretty early on after you defeat the first tournament i'm pretty sure and as you can see most mages they don't they don't have any like melee attacks or anything that can protect them if units come too close and they have really core abilities that basically define of who they are this fire mage the pyromancer is basically an aoe you know fire just shoots out fire the firebolt which is basically the initial damage scales with strength six strength and two intelligence and then the area is based on also strength so you want to upgrade the area until it gets big enough size so it can affect multiple targets usually around 3.5 is a good number and then the actual damage which is the burn scales with intelligence and 
The execution time is based on agility, also including the cooldown. Most of the times you don't want to upgrade agility, you just want to put items with agility to allow the mage to cast faster. Also keep in mind about the stamina cost. Most mages require a lot of stamina to cast, and you want to prioritize stamina usually over intelligence and strength, because without stamina, they are useless. Here's what it, the AoE would look like if you would upgrade it to about 2.5. The Purifier. The Purifier can be accessed in mid game, which is like three to four tournaments, I don't know. And she has two main abilities, Spring and Light, which is basically very similar to Pyram Pyromancer, but it's just direct damage. It's just one target. And it's basically just, you know, casts down a burning light and just does a bunch of damage. And it scales mainly on intelligence. If you look closely, the execution time really matters because the cooldown is very short, but the execution time is really long. So you want to keep that in mind. And her second ability is basically Wings Force, which basically pushes her enemies away if they're too close. The Summoner you can access him through the High Necromancer shop, which is only available if you're in alliance with him. And his main ability is the Shadow Bolt, which is basically a high damage bolt that does damage. And it also deals 50% to cursed enemies. We'll talk about cursed enemies soon because there's going to be a character that afflicts a curse. And his execution time is based on agility. His cooldown is based on intelligence. He also has another ability that raises a goal from the ground. And every 10 intelligence points gives him gives the goal one level. So you just want to prioritize intelligence for this guy. Last but not least are the special units. I call them supports because they don't provide that much damage. They just provide a way to enable your other carries or your other tanks to do work. They basically finalize your comp and they basically strengthen your comp as a whole. Usually they do support in some ways such as buffing a stat, healing, or just crowd controlling or just stunning the targets. First up is the Cryomancer. Cryomancer is very similar to the Pyromancer except the fact that he freezes instead of burns. The stamina cost is pretty similar on his frost bolts, and it also freezes the target. It also doesn't do that much damage. A lot of people tend to upgrade intelligence on this guy. It's actually better to upgrade strength because you want to freeze him in an area and the scaling on the freeze isn't that long. Also, once you get to a good enough area, I would consider upgrading his stamina and his agility. Maybe even health, he just needs to survive and cast a lot of times. His secondary ability is his Icicle Shot, which basically like his time period where he waits for his main ability, he just uses this. This ability isn't that strong, it's, that's why I call him a special unit rather than a carry, because he doesn't do that much damage. He's just there for the freeze. Alright, let's talk about the Flictor, which is the person who casts the curse. If you're uh, in the alliance with the High Necromancer, you need at least one of these characters to enable your other your other High Necromancer characters because she applies a curse, which basically buffs their abilities by like 100 to 50 percent. It's 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 pretty good. You uh, it's based the curse basically just lowers the opponent's main stat by eight points or whatever the intelligence scaling is, and her secondary ability is a shadow shield, which is basically a shield that if the enemy hits the person who has a shield, it basically curses them also. She's really good at applying curse, and she's the only character that can apply curse. And she's a special unit that way because she just curses her opponents and shields your opponent and just curses them. Next up is the priestess. I love the priestess. She's like basically fundamental for every single comp. Just because of the amount of healing she provides from her heal ability, which scales of decent with intelligence, it keeps your frontline units alive all the time, which is really good. Like, that's all you want. Her, she also has the ability to shield, which basically blocks a lot of damage. And by providing these things to your units, your units can never die if she's alive, basically. Her melee attack is just there if they're too close, usually 
that only happens if your units all die uh, or an assassin comes through and she also has bless which is really really good it gives you it gives your unit their main stat which is basically it'll say it right here and once you click on more info main stat intelligence so it basically raises their main stat by a certain amount of points and it scales with 0.15 intelligence and she's just an overall good support unit that can basically uh, make your comp more stable invigorator this is basically uh, another version of the priestess except the fact that he doesn't heal but rather gives stamina his first ability is a melee attack if you want to see that pretty simple enough his main ability is divine vigor what it does is basically buffs their main stat by an insane amount like the intelligence scaling is one which is for every one intelligence points you get one step off so it's really good for funneling your carries it's really good that way and if you pair this up with the priestess your team is basically unstoppable and his secondary ability is restore stamina which is really good if you just want to build a glass cannon that does a bunch of damage and his last ability is weapon block and it's just basically a block if some projectile comes your way next up is a necromancer the reason why i call consider him a special unit rather than a mage is the fact that he fears them rather he, i mean he does have a race dead which basically brings an enemy or a friendly gallider back to life with you know a certain amount of levels and it's it's i mean it's good but i would consider a special unit or a support rather than a mage because he's not casting abilities directly to do damage he also has a fear ability which is really good for stunning the, the enemy the last special unit we have is the shaman the shaman is very hard to get because you don't really use him until the end of the game because you don't unlock him to the end of the game and he's rarely used he has a unique set of abilities though. he has a healing totem which is really good for basically healing your healing your your units and you know it scales with every 10 intelligence points and it also is influenced by the weather here's the execution time and the cooldown scales with agility and he also has a fire totem which basically does the same thing except the fact that he does uh i mean it scales with you know intelligent points it shoots out fire bolts it doesn't say how much damage the fire bolts do but I would assume it's the same as what the Pyromancer would do. And it also is influenced by the weather. The reason I consider him a support is because he's, he's a healer and he also applies burn. He doesn't do direct damage. Not really. Ooh, I think that's all the units that I've covered in Glider Gear Manager that you can obtain, of course. If I miss out on some, please comment down below. And if you want any other new content please comment down what you would prefer and i'll try my best to post something like this as always consider liking and subscribing and thanks for watching